and I think we're now recording. So, uh, great in the session of my first international uh, volunteer, Joel. It's lovely to um, see you and to hear you. Yeah, and to be able to uh, have a bit of chat and conversation about your ministry compositions and your musical prowess within Salvation Army circles. Most people know I've got a few questions to barrage at you. Take your time. We'll have a do and wander and see how it goes. So, my, right. my other first question is: When did you discover this amazing ability to be able to compose music? Um, so, it was something that I kind of gradually grew into. Um, when I was when I was a kid, I would have music assignments that would be to write a melody or things like that. And, you know, I had a lot of help because I was young, but, um, uh, you know, I did all right at it. But my, I got a real interest in theory uh, and I was studying music theory with uh, Harold Bergmeier. Mm -hmm. And um, so he made sure that I was learning things like counterpoint and then four part harmony writing. And mostly they were just uh, harmonizing hymn tunes. Uh, but I really, really enjoyed that and just the process of that. Um, and my parents bought me um, Sibelius notation software when I was 12 for my 12th birthday. And I just started playing around with then, uh, with, with that then. Uh, still wrote a lot by hand, but really I was just trying to figure everything out. Um, and I wrote a few things. Some of them will never, ever be dug up ever again. And uh, But people were were kind enough to to bear with me and play some things that I would writ I had written. Um, it wasn't until I was about 16 that I finally had somebody, I wrote a piece of music that somebody actually asked me if they were, they could play it. Um, so that was the first time I mean, that I remember, uh, right. You know, that's the first time that I ever felt that, okay, this is going all right. Um, yeah. So uh, that same year it was, it was a band piece that I wrote called Deep and Wide. It was just a, a meditative arrangement of uh, the Sidney Cox tune. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, our Harold asked if he could use it with our divisional band. And that was definitely a, a, a moment where I realized, okay, this is, this is going somewhere. Um, and then that same, I also wrote a two part uh, children's song that ended up getting published just a few years later in Psalm Sims and Spiritual Songs with the Eastern Territory, which was actually my first piece I ever had published. So that's when it really started to take hold. Was probably around was the first time that I writ I had written something that people actually wanted to use. Wow! So what, can you imagine? Was that the first time you'd actually heard a piece of your music outside of family circles in a in a public performance, whether it be in a rehearsal or? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, other than you know begging people, hey, I wrote this can you please look at it uh that would have been the first time and i was sitting in the band too which is also a different experience you know uh to actually have the the librarian put the piece on the stand and mm -hmm. you see your own name on it um but yeah so that was the first time i had that experience we played it when i was 17 and actually that that same year um a contesting band in uh the u.s the atlantic brass band actually played it as well on one of their concerts so um, it was definitely a, a big kind of shut system, but it was also a big motivator. It made me want to keep writing more and more oh, and right. see what else I could good. do. Uh, you said you got uh, your parents, I think you said your parents bought you Sibelius for your birthday. So you must have started as a, a pen and paper guy with score, blank scores. So is it just sort of you know, notepads and ideas? Yeah, um, I definitely started with staff paper. Uh, Harold was actually a very strict teacher, which I really appreciate now, is uh, he would require us to write everything out by hand, but he also required me to write without sitting at a piano. So when I was doing my four-part harmonizations, I had to do it entirely from the theoretical knowledge and from using my, my, ear, my inner ear rather than um, working it out at a piano. Uh, so it was very, very strict, uh, not hearing back and just having to understand how the harmony works without, ha without hearing it. Interesting. Uh, when you're give, you know, when you see a hymn tune or you hear something during your daily life with Zoom worship, 
and that idea sparks. Yeah, you know, how how do you make sure that you keep the essence of the tune, the, the originality of the the Kumrondas, the Hammonds, the Amazing Grace? How do you put the the Collier stamp on it? Yeah, it's it's tough because every hymn tune comes from a different era, comes from a different part of the world, comes from a different composer. So even some of the ones that you just mentioned, they all have very different characteristics in and of themselves. Um, and so they want, you know, they naturally lend themselves to different things happening. Um, and so I, I, it's tough. I don't think that I have a particular stamp that I feel like I need to place on every tune that I use or a particular thing that I feel needs to come out in every piece that I arrange, just because the source material itself can be so wildly different. Um, a piece that I used last year, um, it's actually in the uh, Red Christmas book, and my wife actually recommended I use it kind of as a joke, was Personant Hodier. Um, yeah. She just liked the name of it. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, yes, I've heard. Yeah, it, a very popular one. Oh yeah. So I just used, uh, you know, that tune is obviously a medieval chant. So that has a very, very different feel than something else that I might use. Where I'm using like a Keith Getty tune um, that's going to be much more contemporary. So I try to let the tune itself kind of tell me where it wants to go, um, and then. Uh, you know, I worry less about having my own stamp and more about just what the music and what the text needs to say. Interesting. So are you someone that, you know, it, you've got a, a mobile phone full of vocal recordings that you've had during the day and you wake up in the middle of the night and go, that cheer, I've got to get it down. I honestly wish that I was that diligent about it. Um, <laughs> for me, uh, I, I don't take as many notes as I should. Um, what I do have happen is things get stuck in my head. So a mm -hmm. tune will get stuck in my head for days, or a musical idea will get stuck in my head for days, and then I'll finally write it down. And what I tell myself is, if it didn't get stuck in my head, then it must not have been good enough, which is probably an excuse, but uh, it's probably just an excuse for me not being diligent enough to take all my notes. But that's the way I do it, is usually things get stuck in my head. Uh, and they're usually just, but that's usually just the jumping off point. Once I actually start writing, it, it really is a process of working things out. It really is a, a puzzle. How do I get from this idea to this idea and make it work smoothly and make it actually make sense? It becomes more of a puzzle. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing some prep for tonight, I was going back over your list of published works and uh, the spirit within the euphonium solo. I thought mm -hmm. it was lovely and colourful but the essence of it for me was it didn't detract from that the main central music that the euphonium so is written about it's a very simplistic very sensual spiritual sorry piece of music um, but of course it's unity series so you know is that what you're you know obviously your pieces obviously get published and written in different orders Mm -hmm. and, you know, as you say, you've got lots of things in the cupboard that have written years ago that you wouldn't like to see. So, you know, yeah. is, is that when you're starting at the moment, is the mainframe, you know, okay, the idea has come to write it for a certain band or to write what comes naturally, no matter what the scoring has to be, and then hope somebody might want it? Right. Um, I'm still at the point where I get to do a mix of both. Um, that particular solo was actually one of my earlier pieces. That was written um, uh, when I was the, a counselor at a, at a camp in West Virginia, Camp Tomahawk, uh, when I was 18 years old. Um, and I wrote that for one of my students in the band there. So it was simpler by necessity. It ended up being fitting into Unity series just because that's what I had available to me that I was writing for. Um, and, you know, when, obviously when a request comes in from a band, so, uh, you know, if the New York staff band or the Canadian staff band are asking me for a new piece of music, then that is going to be a general series scoring or festival series scoring. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be bigger. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be 
uh, the hardest thing I've ever written. But if I'm writing for a, a staff band, I'm going to write for a full story. Um, so it come, really, you know. Does that come uh, easy to you? Because obviously starting from small, some people would think that writing for, you know, you're, you're writing for New York staff band, you're writing for youth bands, for camp students, and, you, you know, you, they don't want to sort of have their chops blown out. They want to have something they can practice for the family. And you're very adept at that. So d does there kind of a sense of <gasps> when you, you know, the New York staff band says, we've got this big performance next year, we want a Joe Collier piece. Joe Collier. Yeah, does that? Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I find it exciting just because I, I feel like there are so many colors in the brass band. Um, so it, it gives me uh, more, more paints on my palette to choose from. Um, you know, when I'm writing for Unity Series or here in the, the U.S., the uh, American Instrumental Ensemble Series, the same thing, that five part, just, you know, only a few things. You only have a few colors you can choose from. You can only have up to five, maybe six voices if, you, if they allow you to put a divisi in. Um, you know, you can only have, uh, you, you know, highs versus lows. You don't really get color variations. But when I get to write a festival series, type piece, all of a sudden I have all of these options available to me. Um, and so that's the way that I think about it is it, it just gives me more, uh, more colors to choose from, more ways that I can illustrate uh, the text. Um, for me, I always work from the text. Uh, you know, uh, the, I'm always trying to illustrate what the text is saying. So, um, you know, in Thy Matchless King, for example, uh you Ooh, know it has that's one of my favorites. yeah it it has it, it it's supposed to have this excitement of course but it's trying to depict uh you know these flowing ideas too uh as the text is saying different things you know i'm trying to illustrate it particularly the second verse of that one you see that a bit more with this flowing undulating mm. un underneath it's interesting uh, one thing that does interest me about the compositional but as everybody who watches, I, I don't compose music. I don't know anything about it. This is why I'm asking the experts, like yourself and David and Dean. It's also interesting as to being in a Salvation Army context, how, how much exposure do you allow yourself to outside Christian music? Or do you feel if you're doing it for a music camp or an American summer camp or something, it's got to be kind of, hang on, I'll get the Army songbook out and... Let's see where the inspiration lies. How do you, is there a difference between the two? Um, for, there, is, there is a difference between the two uh, at its basic level. So, you know, I've written a couple pieces for contest bands and not, not any major works yet, but just some shorter pieces. Uh, and the, it's different because you're usually trying to write something completely original. I'm not trying to write... Um, based on a, a hymn or a text or a tune that already exists, I'm just creating something completely original, which in the army, we don't do that as much, um, you know, by the nature of the way that we publish music, most of it is going to be based on, at the very least, it's going to be based on a biblical text, if not a hymn or a song already. So it is different in that nature, but I actually try to think of it in the reverse. And when I'm writing for um, outside groups, I still very much use the, uh, the influence of hymns and things like that in my writing. Because mm -hmm. especially with more commonly known hymns, you can use them in uh, a secular setting and nobody minds um, mm -hmm. because it's just such great use to. So, so, so sometimes I'll approach it that way. How can I actually share my witness when I'm writing for a, a group that is not necessarily going to be in, you know, in the army? How can they still hear, how can I still express my faith um, without being so much in their face about it? Mm. It must be interesting because you get some very well-known brass names who, a bit like Robert Redhead, when he was approached to do, I think it was Isaiah 40 or whatever it was, the fact that he is an established, credited Salvationist composer, you know, right. that, that blood and fire is in your veins. It's in your music already. The Lord has blessed you with this beautiful gift of composition. So if they're coming to Collier and asking for a, a, a piece of music, right? That 
it's going to be in your DNA. So you know, if you if you're writing it, you must have that sense of that's what came out, and I'm happy about that. Yeah, and even when I'm writing um, original tunes to use in in secular pieces, uh, there, there's still a lot of that like uh, army style that goes into the tunes that I'm writing. You know, it could be one of those things where after the fact, if somebody wrote a text that fit it, it could work in an in an army setting. Um, so there there is a lot of that that still gets pulled in, even if it's not literally using um, you know a uh, John Larson tune, uh, I still try to, some of that spirit is still there just because that's what I grew up in. That's what I, that's the environment that I learned to write in. That's the environment that kind of has, uh, you know, pushed my compositional career forward, if you will. That's good to hear. Um, you, you previously mentioned Harold Bergmayer as one of your mentors. Who else in your life has really been a a help and a, a strength to you in your compositional work, in your your growth through, you know, from yeah. the start of... Um, Dorothy, Gates, Dorothy Gates would definitely be the next one on that list. Um, she's another one where uh, growing up in the Eastern Territory, she um, very much uh, at Star Lake would take me, you know, into her theory classes and talk about different compositional techniques. But then anytime that I would write a piece as well, um, you know, Harold would look at it, but I would also send it to Dorothy and see what she had to say. And she would give a lot of uh, good feedback. Uh, and I still have her emails that she sent me back over the years um, with notes about pieces that I, I had been working on. And uh, she was always very, very encouraging. Um, you know, even when there's things that I look back now and say, oh, they weren't the, that great she was always looking at the the nuggets that were good and using those as a springboard saying use this idea that you wrote here is really good how can we develop this idea she wouldn't dwell on the other 32 bars that weren't so great um she she was always very very encouraging and looking for the things that were working well so she she was a huge uh uh, influence as well. Those were really the two biggest were Harold and Dorothy. And then there are countless people along the way that have asked me to write things for them or have given the chance of putting it in front of their bands. But the the biggest one lately and the uh, really what I feel is the catalyst for the reason you and I are having this conversation today would be Derek Lance. Um, Derek has been one of the biggest uh, proponents of my music over the last several years. Um, and when I wrote uh, Thy Matchless King uh, and he got a hold of it, and when I did Christ of Calvary, and both of them ended up on the same recording, uh, it was that moment that uh, I started getting messages and emails from around the, the Army world asking for more pieces. Um, and Derek still always asks me for pieces, which I love. I'm, I'm always happy to write for him. He's got such a good band there. So who wouldn't want to write for that? Uh, but then, uh, so that he's been really the one lately that has kind of pushed my, uh, compositional progress to that next stage. Um, what are the biggest lessons you've learned in your music writing experience? Um, <sighs> Well, that's that's kind of a big question. I think the the Not big mine. it's been given to me. So yeah, no, that's fine. I think the biggest overall thing that I've learned is that uh, well, there's two. One is that uh, not everything that I that you write is going to be a masterpiece. So um, you know, there are a lot of times where I sit down and start writing, and it's just not what I want, and I have to be willing to just scrap it and start over, or I have to be put it aside and come back to it later. Not everything is gonna be, uh, be a masterpiece. Uh, that's been the biggest thing. Uh, and it kind of sounds negative, but honestly, it's been freeing because then when you have a, something that you don't feel is working, you don't feel like it has to be representative of what you're doing. You can realize, oh, this, is, this just isn't great, but the next one will be better. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The other is, especially in the Salvation Army context, um, the message of the piece, the ministry of the piece has to be the foremost, uh, the foremost aspect when you're writing. Uh, 
you know, you can write something uh, flashy or showy. That's great. But if it doesn't actually say anything, if it doesn't mean anything, then it doesn't really have a purpose in army ministry. Um, you know, like the one that we already talked about, that matchless king is a hard piece of music. I, I recognize I put a ton of notes on the page, but uh, the 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 notes on the page aren't what it's about. It's about uh, the, the, the message, right? It's about that that idea of worship and praise, and so that's that has to be the main thing. I think it's what a lot of people have said is, um, I think Ray Simulam was famous for it with his musical lollipop. Is you've got a two, three minute piece that's, as you've alluded to, based on a very well known hymn or a song or a tune, and it gets the people's attention. And when you've got their attention, you can move on to the meditations, the, yep. the marches, the selections. And the important thing is that we're not just dishing out the, the proverbial lollipop. That lollipop itself, that two, three minute hymn tune arrangement, even though it may give the corner players a hernia, has still got life. And, you know, yes. it's, it's representative of a lot of me. I mean, I, th I can think of a lot of sort of snappy festival arrangements I've listened to in the last two or three years. They're not overblown. They're not trying to be Tchaikovsky like. They're sort of fun, quirky pieces. But as Bill Hunt has famously said, they've all got a message behind them. And they were all written for a reason. And right. Is that what you consider a successful one of your pieces? If the band plays it through and it clicks and you're thinking, yes, it's worked the way I intended to do it? Yeah, um, I, I've actually been really lucky too, is I, I haven't, um, it might be because I haven't had as many pieces played yet, but uh, I haven't had too many experiences where I've, I've seen like been at a performance or seen a, a video or heard a recording and thought, eh, they missed it. I, I haven't had that experience yet. Um, you know, everything has really been uh, enjoyable to, to, to listen to. I'm still excited that people even want to play it. So, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's all still exciting to me. But your name's out there now. So, I mean, if people like Derek Lance and people are coming to you and saying, we want your music, it's obviously because you've got something that they consider worth giving and that you're a competent enough musician to be able to say yeah that's fine we can trust him to deliver the goods yeah and i i just hope that that's what continues i love i love writing um and i love getting asked to do new things uh you know and some of them are challenging sometimes they come with very specific requests and i have to figure out okay how do i make this work uh but it's i i love it so much just the fact that that want to to use things that I've written um so you know I'm always willing to take more requests uh you know I can't that promise they'll be done next week me. but I'm always willing to take more requests but are, are you are you happy to have the requests come in because there's normally a, a deadline say can we have this piece based on this tune and we need it by this date or do you feel sometimes well, hang on a minute I've got a piece in work but I need time to allow it to flower because I'm not yet happy with where it's going and my mind is not yet flowing. Yeah, I, I think deadlines are a good thing. Sometimes, um, you know, when I get a request, uh, I have to, that is the first thing that I ask is, when do you need it though? Because uh, you know, if their deadline is a month from now, uh, unless it's something where I feel so drawn to it that I can drop everything else and do it, uh, I'm not going to have it done in a month. Um, but if the deadline, if they say, yeah, we want this for next season, 10 months from now, then I might be able to say, yeah, I only have two or three other things that I need to finish up first. And then I'm happy to work on that. So that's the thing. When people request now, the very first thing that I ask is when do you need? It? Um, so, you know, as, as long as the timeline works, I'm always happy to take more requests. Yeah. Are you, um, just happy? I mean, obviously very happy to have the requests, but is there any sort of internal buzz on if someone says, I'd like a hymn tune arrangement of this, or are you phoning him so on that? And you're kind of, yeah, I, you know, you, you've got composers out there who are really adept at doing solos or arrangements. Is there a particular medium that sort of gives your heart a jump, say, do you know what, I really love doing them kind of things, or not? I, I, I don't know 
so much yet because still at the moment uh, I I've only done a few of each different type so you know I've only done a couple more small scoring meditative pieces I've only done a few solos I've only done you know one large scale work that uh, was supposed to be premiered last month obviously things have changed mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I, I've only done a few of those kinds of things at the moment. So I, I don't know if I have one that I particularly gravitate toward yet. Um, I get asked a lot for euphonium solos just because of myself being a euphonium soloist. Um, mm -hmm. So that's always interesting. And, and it's an easy thing for me to, to do because I understand how that works from the soloist perspective. Um, you know, so I have, I've done a couple, uh, both inside and outside the army. Uh, and I just got told last week that there's gonna be another request coming in for another one. But I, I like doing other things. I just finished up a call that I'm really excited to hear. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what else actually works. I, I don't have any particular thing that I, I, I feel like is my wheelhouse yet. Only thing that I haven't written yet is a march. And well, I've tried, well, we're and gonna I still do, just we're gonna happy that one out. A Collier okay. March sounds good to me. <laughs> I just have to figure it out. I, I, I haven't written, I've started a couple and I've just never been particularly thrilled with them. So I just have to figure it out. So it, it's very, very important that obviously the creative juices are flowing and uh, when you're doing something, I mean, it's like anything, if a heart's not in it, it's not turning out your best. So right. you can't sort of, if they come and say you're, that hinging arrangement for the band he said well it ain't there yet and I've got to you know get into the mindset how do you clear your palate when you're you've got to go to a composition when someone says you've got a euphonium say or whatever you know with all the bombardment of music and radio and tv that we have you know do you have to go to some you know how do you clean the, the uh, compositional scope and go okay I've got to think yeah, um, I spend a lot of time at the piano by myself um, and not, you know, n not playing classical pieces or things like that, um, but just literally sitting with the tune, sometimes not even with the music in front of me, just if I've been requested to do an arrangement of a particular tune, um, I'll just sit down with that tune in my mind and just start spending time at the piano just playing, not recording it, not taking notes, just playing and experimenting and seeing what can happen with that tune. Um, and I won't even start writing that day usually. Uh, I'll play for a while, maybe I'll play on that tune for two days before I ever start writing a single note. Um, just to start getting the tune in my mind away from anything else. When I wrote um, I Bow Adoring, obviously uh, uh, thy master's, uh, my master's will is, uh, you know, Wilfred Heaton, that's, that's a masterpiece. Um, and I didn't want to copy Wilfred Heaton. So I had to not listen to that. I had to not even necessarily go to the arrangement in the tune book, but instead go to just the tune and say, all right, how do I hear this tune? How do I feel this tune? It comes down to originality then, doesn't it? Because you've got, you, you, you're exposed to so much music that you, you've got this danger of, unintentionally copying something because if you get a, like an earworm in your brain you, you've listened to a piece of music you've listened to a march and you, you're suddenly going you know, you're in the shopping queue and you're like oh not that again how do you yeah. avoid the um the, this kind of hang on a minute that's a wolf for heat that's an eric bull that's a william hines yeah um well the the thing is uh there there's a difference between intentionally copying something and they're just being influences. Uh, there's always going influences. You can't get away from them. Um, you know, there's uh, harmonic progressions that are going to happen. Some, especially when you're using a tune. Certain tunes just hurt. Harmonic progressions are going to happen. Harmonic um, progression. So, I, uh, what was that? Harmonic progression. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I'm you know, if you're playing uh, like Amazing Grace as a whole, that just the shape of the melody 
it does mean that the harmony is going to have to go a certain direction to, to stay with it, at least for our Salvation Army listeners. I mean, you could go Charles Ives style and the harmony could have nothing to do with the melody. And that would be, yes, that would be unique. That would be original, but it wouldn't be the right palette for our listeners. So you want it to sound familiar enough that our listeners are alienated by it, that our congregations don't feel like they're pushed away. So that does mean that there's going to be certain things. When, you know, um, Bill Himes, uh, his arrangement of Amazing Grace, he does, you know, two different, three different harmonizations in that one arrangement. So chances are, if you're going to do an arrangement of Amazing Grace, you could just look at it and say, oh, this verse is similar to the second verse in Bill Himes' arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be true, but that doesn't mean that you are copying Bill Himes. No, no, okay. It's something that fascinates me that, it must be a real kind of, and you obviously enjoy the challenges that when you get a very well-known hymn tune and you're asked to make a, or you feel drawn after listening to a hymn, to go, how can I make this different to the William Himes version, the Len Ballantyne right. version, the Ray Stedman Allen version? Yeah, and, and for me, that's, that's what it is. Now, the other thing too is just by the nature of my uh, experiences, my palette is different than those composers. Um, I love those composers, and but their influences are, are going to be different too, just by generation, by country, by even the music that we choose to listen to in our recreation. Um, our palette is going to be... So I, I don't ever have to worry that I'm going to fall in the trap of accidentally writing the same arrangement as Ray Steadman Allen. It's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, it, you know, as much as I would love for it to happen sometimes, it just won't. He, he grew up and in both in his childhood and the things that he heard, but also in his entire professional career, he, uh, was being influenced by different music mm -hmm. than I'm being influenced by. Uh, we might have some overlap, but it's not going to be the exact same list. So the, our natural, uh, our, our natural tendencies are going to be different yeah. so that does help that some <laughs> yeah. um you've already mentioned people like dorothy gates and harold bergmayer um there's an additional question i want to add to this so it, it, within the salvation army context not particularly with your in regards to your compositional but who do you in, in terms of their music and admiring their music and their composition who are the composers nowadays who just you think, oh, there's a new piece out, got to listen to it. Who, who are the names that appeal to you at the moment? Yeah, um, in the Salvation Army, it is Ken Downey every time. Um, that you know, name keeps cropping up. Yes, any time, everything that he writes, I want to to know about. I want to understand it. And there are there are lots of other of other great composers. I'm not trying to take away from that at all. No. Um, and then you know I'm I'm lucky to also be uh, you know friends with some some people that are starting to write some really great stuff too. Is like Andrew Wainwright. Anytime that he writes something now, I want to know. I want to know where it was coming from. What he's doing what you know how he's kind of pushing that that limit and same with marcus venables i want to know what he's doing mm -hmm. um so those are the kind of people in the army that i just I, I i feel drawn to their music and i want to know what's going on but especially ken uh he's written so many amazing yeah. amazing pieces of music um uh, that i just i i feel like i have to know what's going on but outside the army there are two in particular still in the, the brass band world. Um, but those two for me are uh, Philip, Philip Wilby uh, and Philip Spark. Yeah, I've heard the names. Um, both of them are uh, absolute uh, master composers. Um, and two of the nicest people that I've had the privilege of, of meeting and, and talking to as well. Um, and so just their, their music too, uh, you know, to, to, to hear their music is an amazing experience, but then also to dig into the score and to study it and to analyze it and to understand what's happening. Uh, it's a, every single time it's, it, it's another composite lesson, um, you know, just in how they craft their pieces of music, just to understand it. So those are, those are 
really, I mean, again, countless others that I'm always interested to see, but those are the names that I would have to say. That give you that real buzz to go, yes, that's worth, that's definitely on the right. uh, next thing to listen to in the car journey or on the train. Right. Yeah. Um, talking about, I mean, as you say, you, you've been writing for a fair while, and I said to both David and to Dean, is there a piece of music that you got stuck on and you had to sort of say, okay, that's enough. I can't keep tinkering with it. It's going to make it worse or it's going to spoil it. And you kind of want to put it in a safe and say, okay, that's it. I'm not going to do any more to it. That's as good as it's going to get. Uh, yes, there are definitely a number of them, especially on ones that, uh, people are not playing um, on ones that have not been published or played or anything like that. There's a number of them where I just said, all right, that's enough. And I'm just putting it aside. Um, but on ones that actually get played, I mean, sometimes you have to do that to yourself to make it work. Otherwise you have been forever fixing things that actually might not have needed to be fixed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, an example of that on pieces that have been published of mine would be, um, uh, would it be actually Christ of Calvary. Um, the, that's one of those ones where yeah. I, I, I always, you know, there, every time I went to it, I felt like, well, I'm sorry. It's a very lovely arrangement. It's on, I think it's available on YouTube. It's a, your arrangement of Lady Jane Scott's version is the one you're talking yeah. about. Used to music. Yeah. Right? And, and, Beautiful. It's and, yeah, and yeah. I ended up being very pleased, you know, I ended up being very pleased with it when I heard it, but, uh, um, you know, it's just one of those ones where I had to, to tell myself, you've done enough. It's, leave it where it is. Uh, otherwise, you know, I would have just always spent more time tinkering, tinkering, tinkering. Mm -hmm. And it ended up, I, I'm very pleased with the way it turned out, but I was not until I actually heard it played. What's the weirdest place? that you can recall any of your music being played? Um, I, I don't know if there is particularly a weirdest place. There is definitely a most, definitely a most unexpected place. Oh, okay. um, I okay. was certainly very, very, very surprised to have somebody text me to tell me that um, Thy Matchless King had been used uh, in somebody's contest performance at the Welsh Open. Um, I had never thought, I had never thought that, uh, you know, it was gonna be utilized in a contest setting at all. Uh, and then let alone, you know, it, uh, it was great. It ended up being the winning performance and things like that. But I was just so shocked to get this message. I had no idea. I had no expectation that it was going to be done. I had no connection to the band that was using it. I, nothing. So to get that text and say, well, I didn't see that coming. It must be really nice to have, you know, the music that you don't think is going to go very far. And then Australia, Zambia, Britain, <laughs> Texas, and you get the phrase, you'll never guess what we played in practice last night. Right, and, right. Oh, where, where did you get the music from? Where did that come that, from? That is actually a fair question. On pieces that have not been published, that is the number one question, where did you get it? But, you know, at a certain point, I have to say, you know what, I'm glad you're playing it. I, I, you didn't buy it from me, but you know what, I, I don't care. Go ahead and play it. <laughs> um... What was the last piece of Salvation Army music that you heard that moved you and why? Uh, that's actually a really difficult question. Um, oh, I'm told. I mean, it's difficult to say, uh, I mean, necessarily what the last last one was. There, there, there's a lot of um, phenomenal pieces and there are pieces that definitely move me every time um, m my wife and I were actually discussing this yesterday. One of the ones that, uh, I would say is probably one of the more recent ones, just because I know that I've listened to the album lately, um, would ha have to be, uh, Kevin Larson of from the East. It, it's definitely, you know, a cinematic, uh, version of it. You know, it's, it's, 
uh, not that it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not the simplicity of writing, you know, light of, well, it's a complex piece, but it's not, it's not the light of the world. It's not Dean Goffin's yeah. like uh, crafting of the tune. Obviously it's a much more cinematic approach, but uh, just how powerful that, that arrangement is and how powerful the song itself is. Yes. That text is just so incredible. Um, especially in my life, you know, uh, where it talks about when it talks about coming from in different tribes and different races or, um, you know, uh, the black, the white, the dark, the fair, your color will not matter there. Those, those, those moments in that, that text of that song are just so impactful in my life. Um, being somebody that is multiracial and then being in a situation, right. And being in a, an environment here, Yes. And being in an environment here sometimes still in the United States that can still be a bit racially charged um, and having students in my divisional music program that that deal with, uh, you know, racial uh, harassment and things like that in their schools and, and in their communities, just the idea of that that message that it doesn't matter um, none will ask where he has been as uh, provided that his robes are clean just that simplicity and that truth to that message, uh, that arrangement gets to me every time. Um, I, I presume this would fall into the same category as to say what you're feeling like at the moment and what your mood is in, as in your favorite piece of army music. Well, my favorite piece of army music uh, is by the inimitable Leslie Condon. Oh, um, lovely. And uh, it's actually the Song of the Eternal. Wow, that's a lovely choice. Yes. Um, and it's not, usually, you know, it's never at the top of, you know, when, when um, no. SA Music Index did their, their, their uh, survey, it wasn't at the top, but it is, I just think, such a, an absolute um, amazing piece of music it's difficult it's incredibly difficult yeah. and at times it's 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 difficult for the listener you have to have an understanding of um the you know what he was trying to convey to fully understand that piece of music so mm -hmm. it's I, I get why it is not the most popular piece and i don't you know begrudge anybody that but i for me that is the piece that just that I think it is just some of the best Salvation Army writing that there is. You, you've, you've touched on a very soft spot. I, I will have to admit that I've said many times that when the Lord calls me to heaven, the third person in the queue after God, the family, will be Leslie Condon. Because I just absolutely enjoy his music. My old bandmaster was a contemporary of his in the military and music schools. So we were forever playing Leslie Condon music. And things like Glory Bound, Blight Heritage, the incredible Bogner Regis. I've been yep. to Bogner Regis. I've been to the, the Salvation Army Holiday Cup that we've had there. So, yep. yeah, I've, yeah, I'm yeah. actually planning on using uh, Blight Heritage with my uh, students this summer uh, with our, our camp here, assuming that we can have our camp here. But I'm planning on using that tune this summer. Oh, I've done a word video of that the other day for YouTube. It's just, I'm afraid Leslie Condon. I, I really envy um, Steve Cobb because he was fortunate enough, I mean, many, many people were fortunate enough, but he had solo with the from Bailez and worked in the staff bad. Another sub, um, appendicitis question kind of thing is, coming from the British point of view, asking a, an established American composer like yourself, is there actually any technical difference between sort of British bands, Australian Salvation Army bands and American or not? Um, well, when you're talking about within the Salvation Army, then I, I don't particularly imagine there to be too much difference. When I'm, you know, you have to know, if I'm getting asked to write a piece, then I have to know what the level of that particular band is. But I don't imagine really too many differences between when, um, you know, the New York staff band is going to play a piece versus when the ISB is going to play a piece. Um, you know, I'm not imagining too much difference there. Or when a small core band in the United States is going to play a small arrangement versus a small core band in the UK. 
there's not too much there you know maybe slight color differences the um u.s bands tend to be a little bit brighter um yep. but for the most part they're gonna be they're gonna be the same outside of the salvation army dramatically different so um but that's because because outside of the Salvation Army, most people did not grow up playing in brass bands. Um, and most of the cornet players are actually trumpet players that have learned that are learning to play cornet or the none of the tenor horn players are nat native tenor horn players. So there are definite differences outside of the Salvation Army. Um, the U.S. is starting to, to move along in that way. The top U.S. bands like the top U.S. contest bands are really starting to 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 kind of put their toe in with the U.K. bands and things like that. But uh, yeah, so outside the Salvation Army, though, it's still pretty dramatically different. Mm. Um, just out of curiosity, from a geographical point of view, what would be your equivalent of a concert hall equivalent to the Royal Abbott Hall in London? I mean, if you had the Chicago Staff Band or the New York Staff Band come to your area what would be the big festival hall that they would have to use yeah so here um in louisville kentucky there's a, a there's a key center for the part um and that is where the uh the louisville symphony the louisville orchestra plays um and it is a beautiful venue um it's definitely not as big as the royal albert hall not very few are but uh it is definitely a beautiful venue. Sounds great. Looks great. Um, so yeah, the Kentucky Center for the Performing Arts. Yeah, I've heard of it. I just think when you're thinking about talking about pieces like um, Song of the Eternal and some of these big majestic pieces, I naturally think of the Royal Albert Hall with the mass choir. And but in a minute, I think the Carnegie Hall. I think was one of them. But yeah, that would be New York. York. Yeah, but from outside of that, you know, if the 1812 Overture was being done by the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra, and you had several, you know, 100 maybe to 1,000 people, you know, what would, it would be the Kentucky Art Center that would mm -hmm. be the actual venue for that? Yeah, for an indoor venue, um, you know, we have, there are several outdoor venues, that, like try to do something, uh, but obviously the type of thing that you're talking about would be an indoor venue. The thing is, I, I live, not quite in the middle of the country, um, but it's uh, certainly not in one of the big hubs in any of the big cities. So, um, you know, uh, of the top five largest cities in the U.S., Chicago would be the closest one, and that's still probably about eight hours away from me. Ouch. That's a fair amount. So, yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Um, you're obviously very passionate and it's lovely to see that. Uh, um, what, what's in the pipeline? Yeah, have, have you got a lot of, you know, is it just kind of requests keep coming in? I mean, do you kind of want to sort of say, hang on, I've got this inbuilt thing that I want to get off my chest and get done first, because if I don't, I'm going to regret it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of writing a euphonium solo. So um, uh, writing a euphonium so I won't say who yet, just in case it takes me forever to finish it. But uh, <laughs> I am writing a euphonium solo right now. And I just finished a cornet solo. And both of them are actually for the same band. So that was actually really fun, um, where I'm getting to write for both the, the corner chairs there. Um, but so I'm in the middle of that. And then the next thing for me is I actually uh, have a, I have a test piece that I've started doing sketches on. Um, not championship level, but you know, not third section either. And uh, I've started doing sketches on that. And so we'll see what, what goes with that. That might take a while. So I might do some other things in the middle of that too. So. Sounds wonderful and interesting. It's um, really nice to hear that you're being used very creatively and it's not just, you know, a hobby in your spare time. Um, apart from army music, and the compositions and the solos. Hey, what else do you do with your time? What are your other passions? Yeah, well, I mean, it takes up a lot of my time and it's not in a negative way. Like the music just really is the vast majority of what I do. Um, and I'm fortunate that, you know, my wife is an army musician as well. So she understands that. And that's something that we can do together. 
Um, you know, and we also started a community brass band here. So we run that together as well. Uh, but outside of that, you know, I spend a lot of time out on my, my bike when I can. I like to, you know, I've been trying to get back in shape, better shape than I've been in a long time. So I've been doing that. Uh, and then my wife and I also run the young adult ministry for our core. So we have um, a lot of the, the, the young adults at our core, um, you know, we do spend a lot of time with them. Uh, visiting them or having them over here and, and things like that. We're, we, we like to, we're about people. We like to have people here or help out people or, or just be involved and see what we can do. Now, I might be putting my foot here. Am I right in thinking you're a divisional music director, a regional music yes. director of something? Yes, I'm the divisional music director of the Kentucky and Tennessee division, which is where this comes from, Kentucky, Tennessee. Okay. So. And, um, what does that involve on a, a weekly basis? Well, obviously everything's a bit different right now, but normally, um, you know, I, I don't have ever a week that I would say is a typical week. <laughs> Things <laughs> always change, but that's the way that I like it is um, I spend a lot of time out traveling to core, seeing uh, their music program or visiting them on a Sunday morning. Um, and uh, then I also, uh, we run a divisional uh, music and arts program where we have uh, about 200 participants that come out to our camp one weekend a month. Uh, and so we have our divisional band and a divisional youth band and a divisional prep band and then creative arts ensembles at all three levels and choirs at all three levels. So we do that one very weekend a month. The music's very time consuming and it's a good job you know what you're doing. Yep. So it's a good time. And then, you know, I'm in the office all the rest of the time, just filling out paperwork or planning for the next event or things like that. So. Okay. Um, favorite Salvation Army song? Um, well, that, that's, that's a tough one too. Actually, it's really interesting that you ask because I've been in the process of writing uh, our devotional curriculum for this summer. Um, and uh, we're using it as kind of songbook devotions. Mm -hmm. So I've just been going through and uh, looking at, you know, we, we had to select 22 and only 22 songs for those devotions. So that was tough. But uh, I think probably my favorite one is not Salvation Army specific, but it is in our songbook. And it would be that, uh, and can it be that I should gain? Mm -hmm. Um, just the absolute, like, just, it's, it, it is our faith, the question of our faith encapsulated in one song and just the, um, the very end of it, you know, um, the, my chains fell off, my, my heart was free, the very end of it, bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. It's just incredible. The The entire thing, uh, you know, you, it's hard to find as many good hymn writers and songwriters as there are now. And there's some great stuff. I happen to lo love uh, like Keith Getty songs and things like that. And John Gowan's writing, his stuff was always very good. But it's still just hard to find things on that same uh, level that just lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, do, you, do you have a favorite so a Christian song outside of the Salvation Army then? Uh, that one changes more frequently. Yeah, um, I thought it might. Yeah, you know, and it just depends on different periods of my life, different things that are happening. Also, just, you know, uh, the rise and fall of popularity of songs, that, that, that happens. Um, so... Another one, there, I would say probably two of them. One is the um, Anastasis, Oh Praise the Name. Um, and I think it's it's really good. It just really, it's by Hillsong and it, it actually just also tells the story of our faith. It, it's the, um, you know, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and, um, you know, how we tie into that. Uh, I really like songs that talk about, uh, you know, that, that really lay out the, the, the gospel message rather than just being about how we feel, so. Yeah, um, I think I'll make it my last question because I think my supper's calling. 
favourite scripture verse or verses? Yeah, that's another one too. Again, there's so many. Uh, I, I'll give you two answers. Is okay. one is, uh, one is a favorite chapter. Um, you know, and that is Romans chapter eight. Oh, there's, there's just so much in that chapter to cling on to. The the idea of then you know. Uh, what shall separate us from the love of God and the idea of, um, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us and that we are more than conquerors, that, that entire chapter is just incredible. But if I had to come down to just a verse um, or small spot, it would be in second Corinthians four. Um, and it's the, uh, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And that's the one that continues on the, you know, we are hard pressed on every side. I mean, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not, not abandoned and, and things like that. But uh, we hold this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. To God be all the glory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I'll call it quits because it's getting on a bit. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely delightful to talk to you, to hear your comments, originality, and your absolute enthusiasm for the love of God in your music is so visible. God bless you in your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I will do 